go to the second half of my lecture. So I'm Marco Te. I'm the assistant director of PIMS, which is the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences, which is based at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And uh, so I'm very pleased to welcome you to the fourth PIMS Marsden Memorial Lecture. Our first lecturers were Alan Weinstein from Berkeley and Richard Montgomery from uh, Santa Cruz, Peter Constantine from Princeton, and I'm pleased that this time we have Matthew De Bruyne from Caltech. And the, uh, well, there's not much I can say. I think everybody knows uh, about Jerry and uh, what he's done for our community, and we thought that it was uh, important to uh, immortalize him in a lecture series uh, which will go on and on at different venues uh, around the world. Uh, Brazil, I don't know where the next one will be, but hopefully it will be interesting and, um, you know, for many years. So, uh, Matthew, uh, our current speaker, was born in France and educated in France. He took his undergraduate as well as uh, PhD degrees in Grenoble and uh, in um, computer science. Okay. And then he went uh, as a postdoc to Caltech where he met Jerry. And Jerry sort of um, invited him to uh, join into the uh, geometric mechanics community and Jerry was very interested in the sort of work that Matthew was doing. Uh, so that's where he got his start here, and then he went to University of Southern California for a couple years after Caltech, but uh, decided that uh, he had to be at Caltech. So he went back to Caltech in 2004, and he's been there since. And the, uh, the one thing that I should mention, I guess that uh, Matthew told me, is that a uh, uh, little anecdote is that Jerry was very annoyed with vaconomics, and uh, I never knew that. Uh, I always kind of favored vaconomics, but it, clearly I'm in the minority. And um, but uh, yeah, this was a, a dirty word in Jerry's office. So anyway, um, we'll proceed with Matthew. And to introduce Matthew's work, uh, we have uh, Luis Delgado from uh, IMPA here, and I'll turn the microphone over to him. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Mathieu de Brun. Um, I had the privilege to follow Mathieu's brilliant career from uh, the end of his PhD up to now, that he's one of the leaders in his area. And uh, just to uh, you know, uh, say uh, the last words, he is currently a professor at uh, Caltech. He's the leader of the Applied Geometry Group and to uh, you know, demonstrate his uh, maturity and his getting to a uh, higher and higher level. He's the director of the Department of Applied Mathematics, Control, and Computer Science at Caltech. So uh, a lot of responsibilities, but uh, I think the main thing is that he's been a source of inspiration for all, all of us, and I think this lecture will be you know, uh, an example of this. Uh, Mathieu. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. So thank you so much. I've never been introduced by two people, so uh, next time we'll try to do three <laughs> so that I can be even blushing more. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. I think that was actually spot on. Um, um, Louise was saying that I was taking more and more administrative responsibilities. That's true, uh, and I hate it. Uh, cannot wait to go back to research at some point soon. But anyway, we'll see about this. Okay, so... Like Mark was saying, I'm really not a mathematician, which makes me a little bit nervous to actually be here in front of you guys. But I have to say that um, if there's one person that changed my research direction in my career, that was Jerry. 
Uh, being a computer scientist, I have to admit that I was unaware of a lot of work by even French researchers like Cartan and Poincaré. I knew the names because there were streets with that names in my neighborhood, but that's basically it. Um, and then Jerry, with his usual patience and, uh, and um, his support, because he was supportive of almost anybody that was doing interesting work, um, he really took me by the hand and told me, well, you better read that book, and then you should read that book, and et cetera, because what you're doing has a flavor of geometric mechanics and all these different topics, and you should really look into it because you may actually learn a few things. And he was right. I have to admit that the titles of the book sometimes were scaring me initially, but I'm glad that I listened to him because a lot of the work that I've done since I met him, so for the last 13 or 14 years now, have been basically with this geometric mechanics flavor, um, for better or worse, but for me it's, it's, been, it's been fascinating. So I'm still not a mathematician, but at least now I, I learned a few things and I've been applying it for uh, basically things that are computer graphics related and uh, Luis was mentioning that uh, that, is, that is my field. So today what I'm going to talk about is how geometry can influence or guide you when it comes to discretizing differential equations. Uh, and I'm going to try to, to show this in a variety of, uh, of examples. So the first thing is I need to acknowledge the fact that Leibniz is the reason why I have a job today. And it's pretty uh, simple. In 1675, he had the brilliant idea, obviously, to introduce the integral sign to replace basically discrete sums. And so it went very quickly from there uh, to the differential modeling and, and, um, and geometry that we all know and love. Um, the problem is, of course, it was a fantastic idea because you can derive things with pen and paper. So at the time, that was fantastic. But now if you fast forward 300 years, computers were invented. And now computers really clash with this idea of smoothness uh, in integration, manifold, etc. So we had to basically deconstruct a lot of this beautiful work that were done in differential modeling. And again, that's why I have a job, basically. Uh, I'm paid to uh, rediscretize things. And again, uh, thank God we can learn a lot from all the work that has been done since the Leibniz years in terms of understanding of geometry. But really, for me, when I use this geometry uh, knowledge, it's really for discretization. Now, discretization, you know what it means. Uh, you take, for instance, a signal, and you can discretize the signal by turning it into just numbers, uh, for instance, bits, but let's say numbers in general. And that has been very successful. In fact, all the multimedia that you have even on your cell phone today, it's all because we know how to do this um, uh, discretization through fast Fourier, et cetera, very, very quickly. Uh, but when you deal with now non-flat domains, just defining the non-flat domains uh, in a uh, discrete matter or signals on this non-flat domain, signals can be scalar, vector fields, etc. This is still very much an active uh, field of research. And that has very uh, interesting applications in medicine, in biology, or even in manufacturing. Uh, so there's, there's a huge amount of, um, of work uh, that needs to be done still. And again, my, my flavor of research has been to try to come up with a discrete version of, of differential modeling, or in, a, in other words, a finite dimensional counterpart to a lot of the continuous theory out there. Uh, and again, to do this, I leverage the uh, differential understanding uh, that is really geometric based uh, to come up with new ways to do computations. Um, and I, you can say that I'm using geometry as my guiding principle. Uh, and the advantage is, as I will say, uh, explain today, not only it's interesting from an academic ex exercise, because just thinking about how to discretize some geometric notions nicely so that a lot of the properties still carry over to the numeric, uh, numerical realm is interesting academically, but it's also very practical. In fact, a lot of my former students are working at companies like Pixar, so it's actually hidden in the movies that you may be watching, mostly because your kids are watching it, I guess. Okay, so for today's talk, I'm gonna try to give um, a, a few vignettes of, uh, of different results that we uh, worked on for the last 10 years. 
Uh, and I'm going to try to show that this notion of discrete differential geometry, meaning really a finite dimensional way of dealing with differential geometry, is not only very nice as a way, as an educating tool, because you can explain some fairly abstract notions in a very uh, simple and practical way, but it's also, like I said, cool graphics. It can be used for movies. Uh, and it also comes up with new numerical methods. So again, I'm using a few vignettes. Uh, it's not the usual scientific talk uh, that I'm giving today, but I figured that for this audience that may be the best approach. And I'll show you that what in computer science we call surface denoising, or at least a basic notion of surface denoising is very much Laplace Beltrami operators in geometry. Vector field design that, are, that is used uh, in uh, all the movies out there or using notions of connections and covariant derivatives hidden in there. Uh, same thing for fluid mechanics and for computational even masonry where I'll show that um, <clears throat> the geometry of tensors becomes very relevant. Okay, so the first topic, very, very brief uh, little vignettes uh, because that's how I started. That's why I still keep this, this vignette as an interesting one because for me there was the, however, uh, simple it looks when I look back, it was still the revelation. So first of all, <clears throat> in um, computer graphics, to represent surfaces, we use very often meshes. Uh, that's not the only way to represent it, but it's a very, very common way. So typically, we use triangle meshes for surfaces or tetrahedral meshes for volumes, etc. So very often, it's just simplicial manifolds that we're dealing with. And in a way, if I look at this uh, piece of surface, you can see that it's smooth when it's rendered properly, but under the hood, it's basically a bunch of triangles. So it's in a way the simplest surface geometry that you can think of because locally, it's flat, it's just a triangle. Now, if you go, if you don't look at just one triangle, you will see that the notion of curvature comes up very naturally. For instance, two triangles next to each other clearly have some uh, uh, mean curvature appearing at the edge. Why mean curvature? Well, because first of all, you can isometrically unfold these two triangles in a plane. So clearly there's no Gaussian curvature. The Gaussian curvature is zero. But it's clearly not the same normal. There's a jump in normal. So you can think of it as the limit case of a smoother surface where the normal would vary from one one of the triangle normals towards the other. So clearly, the notion of curvature, the mean curvature, is linked to this dihedral angle between the two triangles. And now if you look at a vertex where different triangles um, intersect, then you have a notion of Gaussian curvature because you can uh, look at this vertex with all the, the adjacent triangles. Each of these adjacent triangles have a different normal, so you can look through the Gauss map at the image of the Gauss map and you will see that these triangles cover um, a, um, a polygon made out of great arcs and you will figure out that the Gaussian curvature being the ratio of area basically between the Gauss map and the original surface is simply 2 pi minus the sum of the tip angles of the triangles at the vertex which is very logical, right? If for instance you have a, a flat piece of surface, all the tip angles will sum up to 2 pi and you get zero Gaussian curvature. And if you have more skin, if you want, around the vertex, then you will have negative Gaussian curvature. And if you have less, you will have positive Gaussian curvature. So all these notions are very, very simple and can be explained by just waving the hands, basically. So one of the questions that appears very early on in the pipeline of how to process meshes is surface moving. Because very often you start from scanners like laser scanners that uh, will scan a whole, uh, let's say, statue and give you a mesh. But of course this mesh will be noisy because no, no sensor is perfect. Um, so one very simple way to do smoothing when you're dealing with non-flat domains and you want to smooth the domain itself is of course the notion of nonlinear diffusion, also called the mean curvature flow. Right? It simply says that a point on the surface moves along the normal to the surface times a curvature, in this particular case, the mean curvature. I don't know why I put kappa, because I wanted to put mean, cur mean curvature, but all right. Um, so now, how do you do this on a triangle mesh? So actually, let me make it even simpler so that it's even simpler to draw. How do you do it on a curve? If I want to smooth a curve, this polyline that is approximating a curve, how do I smooth this according to this equation in 2D? 
Well, if you can look at what's the curvature. We just discussed that everywhere it's flat, except at the junction between segments. So clearly the curvature is only at the vertices, okay? Now I can look at the normals. That's clearly well defined on, on each of the segments. But now if I want to really move the points according to kappa times n, is the two are not even co-located. So it's not clear what motion the, vertic the vertices of this polyline should move towards or should move uh, to induce this equation. And of course, there's plenty of methods that have been defined, finite elements, et cetera. A lot of people have been trying to even locally simply fit a polynomial so that now you have enough derivatives and you can differentiate. The problem is it's very bad numerically. A typical example where you can get this uh, polynomial fitting um, methods to fail miserably is to uh, try to use sampling that are not very uniform. So for instance, this shape of a face has very fine triangles on one side and very coarse triangle on the other. If you do this poly polynomial fitting locally to try to approximate this term, then you get a smoothing that looks no longer symmetric. So a perfect example where you lose a symmetry that was there initially because of bad numerics. So you're killing a symmetry in a way numerically. Where there is actually a very simple geometric way, if you know that this guy actually corresponds to the L2 minimization of area, then given that area on the triangle mesh is pretty trivial to compute, you can actually formally compute the gradient of area of your mesh. And then from that, compute this equation automatically by just following the geometry. So again, you don't look at the PDE or at the uh, equation itself, you look at what the equation means geometrically, and then you discretize what this equation was intending to do. In that case, uh, area minimization, basically. <clears throat> and it turns out that Darbu knew about this back in 99, and when I mean 99, I mean 18, 99. Um, so this notion that the mean curvature was really a notion of area minimization. So straightforwardly, if you implement this, you get that a terrible mesh, a uh, very coarse mesh, uh, can be smoothed out in one term to, uh, to something that looks more like the intended mesh. So very simple, and it does preserve the symmetries. Um, uh, on the bad example that I showed before, it does keep the, the, the symmetry even if the uh, sampling is very uneven. And on a real example, because synthetic examples are always too trivial because you can always make up a synthetic example where your method will work great. So I always prefer to work on real examples. This one was a really um, um, a scanner done by actually students at Caltech at the time where scanners were expensive, so we were forcing them to do their own. Uh, so they, they got this little um, <clears throat> face that they scanned with their laser. And of course you can see a lot of pimples, uh, there's a zoom here on the eye, you can see a lot of pimples due to the inaccuracy of the, of the sensors. But again, with one little step of this mean curvature flow, you eliminate, oops, you eliminate all the high frequencies basically of the signal, and therefore you get your mesh smoother. Okay, another vignette is how to, how to do vector, uh, vector field design. So you can imagine that if you're an animator in a big company like Disney or Pixar or whatever other companies, you have to uh, use vector fields to design a lot of things. Of course, the artist may not even know formally what's a vector field. But for instance, if you have to put feathers on a, on a character, you clearly have the notion of directions that, needs, that the feather needs to follow. So clearly, they know what's a vector field. So one example that we, um, that we did, one example of research that we did, actually tackled the problem of parallel transport in a very, remarkably simple approach. Uh, I would say almost very stupid approach, but it's so stupid that it works well. Um, so here's the idea. Let's not really talk about vector field just yet. Let's just talk about direction field. So I'm gonna take a unit vector, let's say. And I want to make it, I want to transport it, parallel transport it, on a discrete surface. So I'm given a triangle mesh. I start from one of the triangles of this mesh. I put a little unit vector. Uh, triangle is very nice because it's its own tangent plane, right? So I can just draw a, uh, uh, a vector right there. And of course, the surface is embedded in R3, so the, the metric is just the Euclidean metric induced by the embedding. <clears throat> and now I'm asking, how do I parallel transport this vector on the triangle mesh? 
Well, again, by the same argument that I made earlier, this is trivial. You take this vector here that you start from with the blue arrow being your initial vector. You want to transport it into an adjacent triangle. Well, no problem. You just unfold this two in the plane. Then you just translate the vector onto the other face and then you can put it back. Okay, so this very simple isometric unfolding, then translate, then putting it back, really defines in a trivial um, uh, visual matter the notion of Levi-Chevita connection. I think everybody will agree with this. Okay, um, the only the only thing that I assume really is that it's a piecewise constant vector basically on every face. So you you move from one face to the next. It's only discrete jumps from face to face. That's the only assumption. But really, this is uh, in this is exactly a notion of Levi-Chevita connection, but now for a triangle mesh. And obviously, because it's Levi-Chevita connection, you will find similarities, like for instance, the notion of holonomy along a, a, a loop still works out very well in the discrete case. So you know that if you have a loop on, a, on an arbitrary manifold, if you start with a vector V0 and tr parallel transport it on, along this loop, you will get to another direction, of a vector Vf, and you know that the difference uh, is supposed to be the curvature inside the domain. So here, it's the same thing. If I start at a triangle, and then try to parallel transport around a vertex, I'm going to get to another vector. And what is this vector? Guess what? Exactly the Gaussian curvature, meaning the 2 pi minus the sum of theta, uh, the sum of tip angles that I was saying. By the way, how do you prove this to yourself? Very, quick, very easily, you cut along an edge so that you can unfold the one ring in the plane. Then from this face, for instance, if you have a, a vector in that face, you can translate it to that face and reassemble, and you'll see that the difference in angle will just be 2 pi minus some of the tip angles. So everything works out. Now, <clears throat> this was just levi chevita So one could say, well, this is trivial. This is just levi chevita So how about doing an arbitrary connection on the frame bundle that is on the triangle mesh, basically? Well, pretty simple, at a rotation. So just look back at the graph upstairs where I was explaining um, on the upper part of the slide where I was explaining levi chevita At the end, instead of just translating and then refolding, just add a translation. So you translate and rotate, and then you refold, if I may say. So that way, you can encode really any notion of connection because now you added a rotation when you go from one triangle to the next. So let's look at this a little bit more in detail. So I could, en I could encode any um, connection by just looking at the adjustment angle that you need to add compared to the Levi-Chevita connection. So for instance, for this, for this um, vector on this face, I just want to trans um, parallel transport it to this next face, J. So I'm going to do the exact same unfolding. I'm going to add a rotation. Let's say in that case, I'm going to call the rotation Xij because it's related to the edge between triangle I and triangle J. And that defines an arbitrary connection that this X encodes. So what is it exactly? It's nothing else but the integral of a continuous connection because the connection is an infinitesimal rotation at every point along the path. Here, just imagine that you integrate between that point to that point, you get now a finite rotation, and that's my xij. So for every pair of adjacent triangle, or equivalently for every dual edge that I drew here, you can just store one scalar that you call xij, and that is this additional rotation that you add to Levi-Chevita, okay? So the great thing about this is there's no need for local coordinates. It's really just a scalar on the mesh that you store. So that is very practical. For an artist, for instance, you don't have to <laughs> explain to them what's a frame, uh, which is nice. So let's go one step further. Can we compute trivial connections? The answer is yes, absolutely, because we are in the world of uh, discrete, discrete meshes. So we can actually force the holonomy of a connection to be zero on every cycles, not just the contractible ones, but also the non-contractible one if your surface has non-trivial uh, genus. Um, 
So that means what, what are all the contra contractible little loops on a triangle mesh? There are V of them, V being the number of vertices. Why? Because that's exactly the little loop that I showed you earlier. When you go around a vertex that creates a little loop that is obviously uh, um, uh, contractible, and all the union of these little loops form basically a discrete notion of all, all loops, all contractible loops on your mesh. And then again, if your mesh um, has a, a non-trivial topology, then you have additional paths that are along edges uh, that are basically the, the, the girth around the uh, uh, handle, basically, in, in your mesh, that you can also force um, <clears throat> this, this connection, or oh, a given connection encoded by these values xijs, to be zero. So now if you do have a trivial connection, then you can imagine that, of course, this is sort of the dream connection, because you now can uh, parallel transport a vector in any order you want. Now you have no more holonomy, right? So you can start from a vector in this triangle, then let's say propagate it to the next one over, then to the next one over. The order doesn't matter, you will always get the same thing because by definition, it's trivial, okay? And now this give, defines a notion of vector field, or at least you need vector field on a triangle mesh. So that could be useful for artists to define the vector field. So of course, so far, you're not gonna explain to an artist what's a trivial connection. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna explain what we will ask the, 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 the artist to do, but really this is the math behind. So by the way, this is the math part. What about the numerics part? Meaning, how do I compute the set of value x's for every dual edge on the mesh such that I get a trivial connection? Well, trivial connection up to singularities, because at some point I need to absorb the Gaussian curvature of the surface but I'm gonna describe this in a second. So at the end of the day, it's just a linear solve. Why? Because this matrix A is simply telling me that uh, for every row of this matrix A, it tells me what are the dual edges that are around a vertex. So it's a very sparse row that has zero basically everywhere, and then one or minus one, depending on the orientation of the dual edges, around every vertex. So I have at least V rows on my matrix A, and if I have genus, I have also 2G additional rows. And then in the B, I just put the Gaussian curvatures that I mentioned earlier. Because what, what am I looking for? I'm looking for X, actually I'm putting minus the Gaussian curvature, sorry. Because I'm looking for the value X's, which you remember are the adjustments compared to the Levitia Vita. So I'm looking for adjustments that can kill the Levitia Vita curvature. So I just have to put in B minus the Gaussian curvature at every, point, at every vertex, and it will give me an X that kills exactly this curvature, so that the resulting uh, principal connection is trivial. So again, because, you know, Gauss Bunny will always be there at the end of the day, you need to at least define one point on your mesh that absorbs all the curvatures, because you still have, at the end of the day, that the sum of all the curvatures on all the points has to be two pi times chi. Um, so there's no magic there. If you want it to be trivial at every point, I mean, one of the points need to absorb the curvature. Uh, so you just define a few selected points where there will be a non-zero, uh, it will be a singularity, basically, for the vector field, but all the others, you impose zero holonomy. Now, it turns out that, again, if you look at the kernel of this matrix, it's under constraint, which is a good thing, because that means that you have several choices to kill the, the Levitia-Vita curvature. And then what do we do because we're interested in uh, graphics application? We're trying to take the one that is visually the straightest, meaning the one that is closest to the Levitia-Vita connection. And that's easy enough because we use, by definition, this x to be the deviation to the Levitia Vita. So really we're just minimizing the L2 norm of x. So solving this under the constraint that it minimizes the L2 norm of x, it's A backslash B in Mathematica or MATLAB. So it's uh, pretty simple to do. So here's the, the application now. So if you're an artist and you have a pink bunny, well, first of all, maybe you should get another job, but all right, that's, uh, that's my, own, my own problem. Uh, if you're an artist and you have this bunny and you want to grow hair on this bunny, how do you, I know, uh, how, do you, how do you do it? So what we asked the, um, the users is to define the few points 
that will absorb the curvatures. And basically we tell them that's how you define cow licks, basically, on your surface. And we explain that uh, the, the curvature that they put is the number of time the vector field is going to rotate around the singularity, basically. And so they, they fix a, a certain number of points. And then by just solving this linear system under the, uh, uh, the constraint that X must minimize the L2 norm, you will get directly, and this is a visualization of the vector field that is a little bit nicer than just arrows, but it's basically a flow in the vector field defined by this method. So you see that you get exactly the singularities where the user was asking for them by definition, because we really control completely the, um, um, the triviality, if I may say, of the connection. And if you look in the back of the bunny, because there was no point put, there is no singularities. Perfectly smooth everywhere, no, no problem there. So, of course, this example is not necessarily the best one um, to use in a movie, but that's, that's the idea. And uh, notice that because we use a geometric definition of all these notions, and because we have this L2 minimization of X, the result that you get do not depend very much, or at least visually does not depend at all, on the quality of your mesh. So I don't know if you can see in the back, but here the triangles are very regular. It's all the triangles are pretty much the same size. Whereas here we did on purpose big, big ugly triangles here, very tiny ones here, and the rest is basically the same. And you can see that minimizing the, the norm of X under the constraint of AX equal B on this or on this give the same result. Visually, there's no difference. Why? Because again, we're computing the same continuous thing, which is a trivial connection up to the singularities. Simply, the manifold itself is just approximated with different triangles. But if visually the manifold is the same, in this case, a sphere, you will get the same result. So you have robustness to sampling built in this approach. Uh, you can also add more constraints. For instance, you can say, well, here there's just two singularities and you get this vector field. You can, for instance, let the user draw some strokes. And then you will, for instance, mini, um, try to um, do an L2 match between the vector field defined locally around this stroke and the actual vector field that you get at the end. Anyway, long story short, still a linear system to solve. And now you deform the vector field to follow the stroke that the user um, uh, put, uh, drew on the, uh, on the mesh. And finally, this is when we give the tool to an artist in uh, the first half hour of playing with it. Uh, so here, the artist actually added also length of hair uh, manually by basically painting the length directly on the mesh. But directly, the, the artist puts this, um, it was a very raw, very coarse mesh that we give, but put directly the singularity on the mesh and get this result out of it. So it was nice for us because like when I don't have to do the examples myself or my students don't have to do the examples, so. Okay, a uh, recent very uh, brief word about uh, a recent extension that we did. Um, what I explained to you was assuming that a constant was basically, uh, there was only one vector per triangle. Uh, so in finite element terms, you could think of it as piecewise constant per triangles. Obviously, piecewise constant is not very nice. No, even uh, cannot differentiate easily without getting Dirac's everywhere. So we actually extended this notion of trivial connection to now a uh, basis function that are smoother. It's very much the same construction, just a little bit more involved. But now the advantage is that, for instance, uh, until now we had to give the artist control of where to put the singularities, which for many things is actually the right thing, right? If you want a particular cow leg to appear, in the hair of one of the characters that you animate. You want the artist to control it. But if you ask the artist, you know, uh, just give me the, uh, try to select where the, where the singularity should be so that the vector field is as smooth as possible, they have no idea. In fact, I have no idea. It's not easy, given a complex geometry, where to put the singularities to make the vector field as nice looking as possible. Turns out that once you grow this continuity of the vector field, once you don't have piecewise constant vector field, you can actually dis discretize the notion of uh, covariant derivative very trivially, in fact, in closed form. So you can compute the exact Dirichlet energy of your reconstructed vector field 
uh, as an operator. Same thing as a matrix, basically. So now you can compute, in fact, an eigenvalue problem because if you find the lowest Dirichlet, I mean, the vector field that has the lowest Dirichlet energy for a given L2 norm, then you will actually find the singularities automatically. That makes the vector field as smooth as possible. And for instance, here's two examples. So on the bunny, you see that you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven singularities that appear at extremities. Now, whether they are right or not, I would guess that mathematics tells me they are right. Uh, but of course, I minimize uh, the notion of smoothness. I took the notion of smoothness to be Dirichlet energy of vector fields. Uh, there may be better notions of smoothness out there. As long as we can compute them as a linear operator on the coordinates, we should do we should be able to do the same thing. And this also extends to uh, arbitrary uh, fields, so it doesn't have to be just vector field, it can be like cross fields or um, uh, line fields or direction fields, etc. So it, it, it extends to a lot of, um, of other designs of, I would say, field, not just vector field on surfaces. Okay, now for a completely different topic, Fluid, fluid mechanics, which of course is also useful in, uh, in graphics and movie, uh, movie applications. So fluid mechanics is of course part, part of uh, mechanics. And in fact, the notion of, or the interest of geometry or the relevance of geometry, I should say, in the context of numerical solvers of ODEs and PDEs uh, is nothing new. There's been actually a lot of work uh, that tried to develop numerical solvers for dynamical systems that somehow retain some of the structures of the original uh, mechanical system, both at the algorithmic and at the computational level. And in fact, uh, for instance, there's a wonderful book by uh, Harer on uh, ODE uh, that explains how notions of si uh, dynamical systems that, are, that have symmetries, invariance, time reversibility, etc., can be captured at a, at a numerical level that still preserve those geometric properties in, in the numerical realm. So that's always a good thing. Uh, again, there's been a lot of work in this direction. And it's not just academic, it actually very often gets you superior uh, um, numerical properties. So it's not just for the prettiness of it, it's also because it works better on many of the examples. Uh, and personally, I got account, um, acquainted with this approach through Jerry uh, through the work that he did on discrete mechanics with uh, some of his students like um, Matt West was mentioned earlier today. Uh, and it's the idea to capture the dynamics of a dynamical system through a variational principle that is directly done at the discrete level. Uh, so per personally I like as low, as, as low order as possible because I want my integrators to be super fast. So I always explain things in, in, uh, in very simple ways where if you think of your, manif your um, state variable Q, uh, if you think of the path that this, vi this variable follows from uh, time T0 to time big T, then you know that the path is on a manifold, let's say, and you want to find the path that extremizes uh, the action uh, under the constraint that it starts and ends at these two points. Well, you can actually compute the notion of a discrete action by just defining the integral of the continuous Lagrangian between two consecutive positions, QK and QK plus one. So if you have this discrete Lagrangian that is really nothing else but an approximation of the continuous Lagrangian integrated between two time steps, then you can now define the sum of all this uh, between Q0 and QT to be your discrete action, and now you can formally do the variation of this equation to get you the discrete or the Lagrange equations. And there's a lot of properties uh, that gets, um, that are captured by this approach. First of all, a lot of the conservation laws are preserved automatically, like momenta, there's a discrete Noether theorem, there's Legendre transform also in the discrete world, actually two. Uh, energy is preserved very well because the integrators are symplectic or multi-symplectic in certain cases. Um, uh, there is dissip if there is dissipation in your system, you can, add through Lagrange d'Alembert uh, the, uh, the dissipation and you will capture the dissipation well. And without the dissipation, your system is basically having no numerical dissipation. So that's, that's a great property to have. You can do higher order integration if you want. 
And what I like about it is, again, this idea that your path is approximated by a polyline. Uh, even for very small amount of time steps, I mean, even for very coarse resolution of your mechanical system and large time steps, you will still capture the motion fairly well because you're basically doing coarse approximation of the underlying boundary value problem, and it's much more stable than doing an initial value problem a la, a la Newton. Uh, so in particular, in animation, it's very nice because if you do a preview of a complex animation with a very coarse resolution, it will actually be fairly predictive, which is a good property to have if your name is Disney. Um, there have been a lot of uh, development in this area. We, we've done some work, so uh, Paola, I think, mentioned the snake board. So we did some optimal control to uh, try to find what is the position that the guy should do to go from one place to the other. So actually, I think I have a movie. So this is an optimal path uh, between two positions of the snake board, translation of the snake board. Uh, helicopter is also a typical example of, uh, of mechanical system that we can simulate pretty well. Or even boats on a, a troubled sea. Uh, anyway, we, we, we can do this, this uh, sort of things and there's been a lot of work in the area uh, to develop this type, of this type of integrators. But then at some point, Jerry actually challenged us to work on fluids. And of course, we started with the simplest example, well, simplest, but not simple. Uh, simplest example for fluid, which is ideal in incompressible fluids, the typical Euler equation. And there, uh, again, through Jerry, I learned that the geometric way to think about Euler equation is through this unusual state space. And I say unusual because I talked to quite a bit, quite a few people in, uh, in computational fluid dynamics in CFD. and. Uh, most of them were either not aware or have heard of, of it but never really used it in practice. So this notion of volume preserving diffeomorphism as being the, the, the actual way to encode the motion is not traditional, let's put it this way. Um, and we know that the motion, uh, because of the work of all, this, all these people, we know that the, the motion of uh, Euler, ideal Euler fluid is basically a geodesic directly on the manifold of volume preserving deformorphism. Uh, and it's, it extends nicely to different systems, including Euler Poincare systems with advection, and there's plenty of people in this room that know much more than me on the topic, but it's very appealing to have this whole geometric picture, not just for ideal uh, Euler, but for all this system like magneto, hydrodynamics, complex fluid, etc. So we started uh, very simply just for Euler fluid, and we tried to discretize the diffeomorphism. The first thing that came to our mind was, okay, the di volume, uh, volume preserving diffeomorphism, if we can find a finite uh, dimensional approximation of it, we should be okay. Uh, somehow it never worked until uh, one of uh, Jerry, Jerry's students, I don't know where he is, right there, Dimitri Pavlov, uh, came up with the idea that, well, maybe the diffeomorphism is a little bit too abstract. Maybe we should encode instead the action of the diffeomorphism on functions, meaning the Koopman operator, basically. So if you think now of your domain, and here I'm gonna take a very simple example just for the sake of clarity. If you think of your domain as being a square, let's say in 2D, with a regular grid on this square, you can <clears throat> come up with a, uh, an operator that will be a discrete version of Koopman's operator, and it will be encoded by a matrix that will be used to push forward scalar functions through the diffeomorphism that is implied by this operator. So more precisely, if you have a continuous function f, you store it on the grid as its integral per cell, so you discretize your functions into this piecewise constant space of functions. So uh, I use big F i for cell i, the value of f in cell i. So now you have a vector of values big F, that encodes your function. And what you're gonna encode is a matrix Q that will really be such that Q times F is the discrete equivalent of the push forward of F by the diffeomorphism phi. So you don't use phi directly, but in a way, the way it acts on function, okay? So now, not so, not so surprisingly, because of the Koopman operator properties, 
because we're using incompressible ideal fluid, this matrix Q better preserve constant functions because that means mass preservation for fluid and it better preserves L2 inner product of functions and we have defined discrete functions so we know what's the uh, inner product of, uh, of functions. Uh, so it must preserve these two quantities because that's both mass and volume preservation. If you don't have that, that's not a good approximation. So it turns out that on this simple regular grid, that means that your matrices have to be orthogonal and doubly stochastic. And I say signed doubly stochastic because very often when people use the term doubly stochastic, they mean positive doubly stochastic. Here it's signed. So we need the sign, otherwise it's not a Lie group, basically. Um, so that's, that's our Lie group approximated. That's the, this matrix is Q. If I have N cells in my domain, there will be matrices of size N by N, and such that they are orthogonal and uh, doubly stochastic. Actually, they, are, they have to be orthogonal and stochastic, but therefore that means by, um, you can prove that that means doubly stochastic. And of course, once you have a Lie group, you have automatically the Lie algebra, which now corresponds to the Lie derivative of the vector field phi dot phi inverse. And there will be simply matrices that are anti-symmetric and sum to zero per row and actually per column too. And now on this, you actually use uh, Hamilton's principle. And in fact, we cannot use as, as is the uh, Hamilton's principle. We have to use the Lagrange d'Alembert because you notice that this A, we had no notion of sparsity on A. A could be wide. It could be having some kind of notion of Lie derivative between this cell here, this corner here, and this cell here, which doesn't seem physical. Okay, so what we did, we restricted A through a non-holonomy constraint because it's acting on A, so it's obviously uh, non-holonomic. We uh, restricted the sparsity of A to be only between cells. If you want, think of it as just being a little flux between cells that tells you how the functions are advected uh, or infinitesimally pushed forward between cells. And then you get directly by turning the crank, there's no approximation after this definition of Lie group and the algebra, you get directly an equation, a quadratic equation on all the, uh, this little motion between cells and you can solve for it and you get directly an integrator. By the way, notice that the discrete integrator looks a lot like the continuous one where the commutator of matrices is now the Lie derivative. So that's, that's fairly, fairly natural. Uh, H, by the way, was the time step, but that's not important. So here's an example that we did to make sure that it was working approximately well. Um, so we started with an example of two Taylor vortices that are sufficiently close that they are actually at a, at a bifurcation point, meaning that if they get a little bit closer, they will merge, and if they start further away, they definitely separate. So here they are exactly at this bifurcation mark, if you want. And we tried to simulate this um, system on 4,000 triangles or 55,000 triangles. And you see that uh, the, the behavior is basically the same. So I actually uh, show a movie where we juxtapose the two on top of each other. So this is the coarse grid animation. Then I switch to the fine grid animation. And then at the end, I switch back to the coarse grid. So you see that the motion, you will see that the motion is basically very uh, not influenced by the size of the sampling. So it's remarkably robust, again, to sampling. Then we extended this uh, to 3D uh, domains uh, by exactly the same method, uh, nothing changes. Now it's a little bit more complicated because you have tets that, of course, are not regular, so the equations are a little bit messier, but the, the discrete equations look, at first sight, exactly the same. There's no, there's no special magic. Um, okay, so we, so that was, that was an interesting success story. We asked one of our students, who was actually an undergrad at Caltech, but I have to say he was an exceptional undergrad at Caltech. We asked him to add um, to this integrator um, the magnetic field, basically, through a semi-direct product. And basically overnight, he came back to us saying, yeah, it works. So uh, by just adding this notion of semi-direct product of the, of the magnetic field, we, we did get results already right there in 2D where the energy was very well preserved over long periods of time. You see, by the way, uh, this is not one to zero. This is, we zoomed in on the energy to show that it oscillates like the typical symplectic integrators. 
And even notions like cross helicity that is supposed to be preserved uh, for ideal magneto hydro uh, dynamics was exactly preserved. And more interestingly enough, we also, sorry? No, this was 2D. Um, actually, 3D, Dimitri is uh, working on it. <laughs> yeah, for MHD, 3D is actually not complicated. For complex fluid, you have to go to some <coughs> trickeries, but the, the big picture is still the same. Uh, one, one thing that uh, surprised me, because I, mostly because I didn't know about it, I had to look at Arnold's book on uh, topological invariance in dynamical systems. I didn't know that in MHD, if you have no magnetic resistivity, then uh, there should be no magnetic reconnection, meaning that the topology of the field lines, of the uh, magnetic field lines at the initial state should remain the same. There should never be some little holes being created in the, in the, in the field. They should only deform, but not change the topology. And uh, there's this classical example that people have, have run where you start with uh, direction fields that are alternating like this and an initial velocity that makes them oscillate. And <clears throat> methods that have been shown in, the, in 2005 or six to be very accurate fail to capture this uh, uh, no magnetic reconnection. Whereas ours, I guess because it builds in this topological invariance and everything directly in, in the geometry of the, of the discretization, we have no, re, no uh, spurious magnetic re, uh, reconnection. And finally, just to show once again, because uh, this is one of my favorite topic, this um, robustness to sampling. Here, I put two, two results, one by Cordoba and Mariani in 2000. That's the one that is in dotted line. I guess in 2000, they only could plot dotted lines. Uh, and ours are in color. So dotted lines are, of course, ISO curves of the color version, but they, they did their simulation with the dotted line on a 2048 squared grid. We did ours on a 64 squared grid. And you see that the results were exactly the same. So again, an example where we were surprised actually at the quality of the resulting integrators. And I'm sure that there's plenty of geometric properties that I personally don't even understand, which explain those numerical results. But Okay, how much more time do I have? Sorry, I forgot to look at when we started. So how, many, how much? 15 minutes, okay. Okay, so the last topic is a much more, uh, well, actually a very recent topic. It's within the last year, but I, I figured that this was a good vignette to, uh, to show because it mixes a lot of different fields. Um, and we were the first to be surprised of the connection that we found. So very briefly, uh, there's a lot of geometry in nature. So I love this picture. This is at the end of, uh, not, not the bottom of the ocean, but let's say, uh, yeah, at the bottom of the ocean, but near the shore. Uh, you see all these little things here are little fish. And are, this fish like to live at the bottom, so they like to live in the sand, basically, at the interface between the sand and the sea. But they don't like their neighbors. So they try to make their own little nest, if I can call it like this, by pushing sands uh, as, as much as they can, but everybody does this. And so what happens at the end is that they form these very geometric structures, which you may have heard about look like Voronoi cells. I will explain in a second if you don't know. Uh, and you find this notion of Voronoi cells in a lot of things around, uh, around nature as soon as you open your eyes, basically. So I'm going to explain, instead of these Voronoi diagrams, I'm going to explain power diagrams. It's a slight change on, on uh, Voronoi. So if you start with site positions, like the, the fish positions, uh, and you look at their Euclidean territories, just like for the fish. So what do I mean by territories? That means that all the points that are closer to a given site than any others. So for instance, for this site, all the points that are within this little gray cell are closer to that guy than to anybody else. Fair enough, simple enough to, uh, to verify even visually. So we call this the Voronoi diagram. And by, by the way, you can dualize this picture, meaning once you know the connectivities between the cell, you can now draw edges between the vertices if the cells are neighbors to each other, and you get what is known as the Delaunay triangulation. I'm sure you have heard about it, but I prefer to uh, recap it real, real quick. Uh, 
Now there's an extension to this where you consider that the fish are not all equal. So it's the non-socialist version of Voronoi diagrams, where now everybody has a different weight, or possibly a different weight. Now you can still define a notion that's called the, uh, the, the power diagram, where now you still use a notion of distance like the Euclidean distance, but now you slightly alter it by the weight. So if this vertex here has a small weight and this vertex here has a big weight, I'm gonna now decide that the, the limit line in between them is based on this notion of distance. It's very simple, right? You just translate every, di every distance, Euclidean distance, by the weight of the, cell it's, of the site itself. And if you compare between the original Voronoi and this modified Voronoi, the big weights get bigger cells. Okay? That's, there's something about this in life in general. <laughs> but in this particular case, the bigger the weight, the more territory you have. No surprise. Um, okay. So this weight just altered the L2, the L2 distance, basically, and therefore changed the connectivity between the, uh, the sites. And again, same thing. You can define a dual to this power diagram by simply linking any site that's or sharing a wall between their two territories. Okay, and we call this the weighted Delaunay triangulation. Okay, now the funny property about this weighted diagrams, which by the way is of course just a generalization of Voronoi, because if you take all the weights being either equal uh, or just zero, if you want, then you get Voronoi. So it's just a generalization. But the interesting thing is, no matter what the weights uh, you use, the primal meaning this edge linking two sides and the dual edge associated with it, they will always be orthogonal. It's simple to prove, but it's non-trivial the first time you see it. And we know that this notion of, uh, of power diagram has been very useful for, for meshing and computational geometry in, uh, in general. But it turns out that there's many other uh, surprising applications. And in fact, one of my most recent students, Fernando de Goiz, uh, a pure product of Brazil, by the way, uh, I did some fantastic work in this area. And I have to say that I, I was surprised at the um, variety of applications where those power diagrams show up. One example was for dithering. So I'm going to go very briefly on this one. Dithering is basically what old printers were doing. When you want to print a grayscale image on a black and white printer, you have to simulate the different levels of grays by just the density of black points, basically. So now, how do you do this geometrically? Well, that's not trivial, but what we showed recently is that if you take your black and white uh, picture, you can find sites of a power diagram that has two properties, and that will provide a great discretization or dithering of your image. The two properties are the following. Every site has to be at the barycenter of their own power cell. So they have to be really well-centered within their territory. So we only want... Uh, well-centered territories around the sites. And the second condition is that to make sure that we capture the actual image, we want to make sure that the integral of the gray level within each power cell is equal. What does it mean? It means simply that every discretization point that we use should carry the same amount of ink, basically. So that means that when I find the, the sites that satisfy this condition, I'm going to have many more points on the black regions and very few in the white region. Why? Because I need a bigger cell to accumulate enough ink inside. Whereas in black regions, even a tiny little power cell is enough to get my share of ink. So all these points are placed exactly in a position where the amount of ink inside each power cell is equal. And you can see that if I remove the picture, you still see very well what it was. And it, it's in fact linked to a notion of uh, blue noise uh, sampling that I'm not described. There's actually people even here that worked on this topic. It's a very interesting topic. But the, 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 the idea is that this is a good sampling method because it removes any kind of artifacts like moiré patterns that you can see. So here you may think that it's a, a grayscale picture, but in fact, it's a huge dithering of, of an initial picture. So again, you can put this point in a way here, I reversed, I put white point on a black background, but it's the same idea. Say that again? Is 
No, I showed just the point. But they are coming from a power diagram, so I could have drawn the, uh, the whole power diagram. It's just a little bit too big for me to visualize this nicely. Okay, so now, how does this connect to masonry? Well, until not that long ago, I had no idea. But here is, here is how it works. So what is masonry, first of all? is uh, basically a structure that you want to construct, but you don't want to use cement, if I may say. In the sense that you would like to assemble different bricks together and make sure that they stay up and they don't collapse like this by just mere fact that they are compressing against each other. So really, you can ask, given a shape and some kind of a load because of the, the weight of the material, can a masonry structure stand? And again, by masonry, I mean that we assume that there's only compression going on. So the bricks are only compressing their neighbors, basically. You can pull a little bit of cement because it's always better to be safe. Uh, but really, technically, you should not even need the cement to make it stand. So, turns out that this has been uh, looked at for a while because, of course, there's a lot of examples of um, masonry structures since the antiquity. Um, and there's a safe theorem by Heyman that abstract this, uh, this understanding of the bricks pushing on each other in a very mathematical way. Uh, Heyman basically said, a, a masonry structure will stand if there exists a thin shell that is included within all the bricks. So forget about the bricks. Now we're just looking for a smooth shell such that this shell has, basically is at equilibrium. So that means that for a given load on the shell, the compression inside the, cell, the, sh the shell uh, is such that it should compensate for this gravity force. That means that you can separate, if you want, the compression forces into horizontal components and a vertical component. The horizontal components, sorry, the horizontal component, component should cancel each other out, and the vertical component should exactly compensate gravity. Simple enough. And Heyman said, basically, if you have that, then your masonry structure will stand. And so, of course, we use exactly this definition because now we don't have to deal with how many bricks you put or anything. We just deal with this stress field condition. And mathematically, you write it into uh, three, three conditions. Sigma has to be positive definite. So here I'm cheating. Mathematically, it should be negative uh, because uh, compression should be a negative tensor. But if you change divergence into minus divergence, then positive semi-definite is fine and it's easier to explain because people are more used to PSD than NSD. So I'm just switching the sign completely. So sigma is positive semi-definite and the divergence of sigma is zero, which means that in, in the plane, uh, horizontal components, if you want, of the forces cancel out. And now the divergence of sigma times gradient of Z, which is now the negative, uh, the vertical component should compensate gravity. So far so good? Okay, so these are the equations. And of course you see that these two conditions are purely on the stress tensor itself. The shape intervene only in this equation. So really, it would be great if you could study the space of all divergence-free tensors, and then once you have this reduced space where you have only the divergence-free tensors, then you can talk about whether a shape can uh, uh, support itself. Okay, so how do we discretize this? So in the continuous world, it turns out that we have these three conditions. So you have a domain and a height. By the way, the domain can have a hole or a number of holes. Uh, you see this in a lot of architectural buildings. Now in the discrete world, a lot of people have proposed discretizations and they always discretize the, let me go back, this tensor sigma, they discretize it one way or the other that basically is equivalent to these equations. They have a notion, sorry, there. They have a notion of discrete tensors per edge. That's why it's written sigma ij because it's between a vertex i and between a, ver uh, and a vertex j. So they want sigma ij's on each edge that are strictly uh, positive, let's say. They call this uniaxial uh, singular stresses. And they need this equation, and that's the balance of forces. So the sum uh, for a vertex i over all of its neighbors adjacent to it of sigma ij times the vectors uh, of the edges seen as vectors, if you want, in 3D, must be equal to zero, zero. That means that in the plane, forces cancel out. 
and in the z direction it must compensate gravity. Uh, so all these people have worked this out. The problem is if you look at the number of equations that you have here and the number of constraints, it's always over constraint. No matter what triangulation you pick, you will never get a unique solution. There, there's always uh, over, you're over constraint basically. So somehow this discretization is not really the proper discretization of the problem because you cannot find a solution to the problem. So people use L2, um, What's the name? Yeah, least square, thank you. Uh, use least square solutions to get as close as possible, but basically the discretization is not right, just purely based on the number of equations. So, what we realized is that actually the power diagram business that I just explained is exactly the right solution. Here's why. You want your divergence of sigma to be zero. And I told you that people have worked out its link to uh, uh, notions like elliptic operators, so I'm not going to go into this, but they have worked out that in the plane, that means that the sum for a vertex, for a vertex J or a vertex I for all the vertices J around it of sigma IJ of uh, multiplied by XI minus XJ and YI minus YJ should be zero. That's the discrete version of this divergence of sigma equals zero. But what is this? Let's look at it graphically. This is xi minus xj for every edge. I can see the edge as a vector itself. Then sigma, what it does, it simply scales this vector. So I get now different scaled vector. And I know that this must sum to zero. So here I can do a little trick. I rotate these vectors. Now if I rotate vectors that sum to zero, that means that they create a little polygon. Now if you notice, this little polygon here, I have sigma ij, for instance, for this edge between i and j. I have sigma ij times this vector for that cell, but I will have the same thing when I do it for that vertex now. So in fact, this little polygon, you can do it on every vertex, and what do you get? A diagram, meaning you get a lots, lots of dual cells that are all connected one to another. And notice that what we did here was just taking an orthogonal uh, to this vector. So the primal and dual edges are exactly orthogonal to each other. And so the only thing that it took us to do is to prove that power diagrams are the only set, the only type of dual diagrams that has uh, the property that primal and dual edges are orthogonal to each other. So basically we proved that to get divergence of sigma equals zero, this sigma j's has to come from a power diagram. And in fact, the final formula is rather uh, simple. The sigma ij for an edge should be the ratio of the dual edge divided by the primal edge. So that means, if you followed so far, that means that the sigma ij's, you cannot pick them independently one another. You, they are not independent. They depend on weights that you pick on vertices. And from those weights on vertices, you can compute this guy exactly. So what people were doing by assuming that sigma ij at every, at every edge was random or was arbitrary was actually not capturing the right degrees of freedom. So now that means that we know exactly the reduced space of divergence free field is just one weight per vertex that defines this weird power diagram that I mentioned. And the power diagram itself simply represents the force field inside the Mason restructure. So now to conclude this real quick, that means that we just have to solve for an LP problem because we still need to enforce that all of this sigma ij is positive, which by the way, geometrically just means that every dual edge is positive. There's no reversed uh, dual edge. And this is an under-constrained problem like you want it to be so that now you can do boundary conditions properly. Uh, and therefore there is now a unique solution to any problem with proper boundary conditions. So for instance, for this mesh, you discover that indeed there exists a dual, um, uh, orthogonal dual to the, to, the, to the primal mesh. Therefore, this shape actually stands on its own. Uh, other examples, something that we started from that obviously does not stand on its own because it concave inside. We, we deform it, we change the height, the, the minimum possible to make it self-supporting and that transforms it into this. So all the part that was concave gets uh, 
are raised so that it creates a self-supporting structure. Uh, this is also self-supporting and all these examples are also self-supporting and you recognize things that I'm sure you've seen at different churches. Uh, so at least visually, it's the I norm. It seems to be doing the right thing. Okay, so to conclude, uh, what I've been doing and uh, that's required that I read a lot of geometry and mechanics papers and books, uh, but that's part of the fun, is to really try to use geometry to do computations. And I really try, and I, I wish I had a trademark on this, I really try on the numerical side to respect the geometry. If there's some geometric invariant and symmetries in the initial problem, you better make sure that the numerics capture this precisely, otherwise you're gonna have trouble. Um, and uh, yeah, so you recognize the reality of computations in the sense that we have to deal with finite dimensional things, but you try to be guided by geometry. And one of the, the things that we learned along the way, which I guess is obvious for a lot of people, but it was not to me before, is you should not stare uh, in the eyes of a PDE and try to guess how to discretize it. <laughs> That's a bad idea. Just go to the variational principle because you'll get much better result that way. Uh, same thing, spatial discretization, you should not try to come up with your own ways of doing derivatives. You should be guided by geometry. In particular, I'm a big fan of coordinate-free computations. A lot of the example that I showed to you, there was no need for frames or anything like this. You work only with numbers on simplices. So it's really coordinate free by nature. And this is linked to this whole um, discrete exterior calculus, which is a version of exterior calculus done on meshes. And actually the finite element uh, compu uh, community has also done very interesting work, which basically use higher order basis function than what we do. Uh, and if you want to see a great example where uh, the, the discrete version of a theory is particularly simple and great to use for your students to make them understand, ENM is a great example. And uh, Iris Stern did his uh, thesis with, uh, uh, with Jerry and myself and, and did a, a very nice exposition of this of these methods. And there's a lot more to explore. A um, lot, of, lot of my students have been uh, looking into things that have not matured just yet, but I found tremendously interesting and there's a lot of geometry behind them. So hopefully uh, we'll get more uh, research results still using geometry as, as the core tool to develop our discretization. Thank you so much. <laughs>